Arthur Herbert Fonzarelli, the Fonz, was the pinnacle of cool for a generation. The leather jacket, the jukebox, and A. And in 1981, he hit the cultural height of fame with his own Saturday morning cartoon show. Unlike, say, Mork and Mindy, in which Robin Williams was limited by the constraints of reality, there's nothing inherently animated about Happy Days. But that wasn't a deterrent for the Academy Award-winning studio Hanna-Barbera when they created this. We got it all together now, gang. The Fonz. His doggy name, Mr. Cool, and the Good Group. One flaky time machine, and a future chick named a Cupcake. Oh, now the gang got zapped into that time machine, and they're like traveling through time. My, my. They do not dig where that machine is going, but they sure hope to get back to 1957 Milwaukee. Can you dig it? Yeah! The animated Fonz didn't just jump the shark. He time-traveled so he could ride a brontosaurus. Jumping the shark seemed baked into the premise of many of the cartoons from this period, because they started as a gimmick and only kept gimmicking. Besides a big hit with the Smurfs, this period for Hanna-Barbera was littered with Scooby-Doo knockoffs. It's Goober and the Ghost Chasers, guest starring the Partridge Kid. A studio that had once produced the Flintstones, Quick Draw McGraw, Huckleberry Hound, Yogi, Snagglepuss, and the Jetsons was producing uninspired paint-by-numbers replicas. The parody was at its peak when the animated Fawns had a supporting role in Laverne and Shirley in the Army. The cartoons essentially amounted to barely animated fan fiction. For years, art and commerce clashed on Saturday mornings, and commerce had a far better record. And yet only four years later, a cartoon would raise the artistic bar for the medium, and strangely it would be based on the currency of kid commerce, candy. Animated television started in 1949, as it should. A talking rabbit wearing a suit of armor riding a horse toward camera. It was the spectacular opening of Crusader Rabbit, whose other animation wasn't nearly as good as the opening. It was designed with little to no movement by Alex Anderson, who was inspired by Baby Weems from Disney's Behind the Curtain feature, The Reluctant Dragon. In the Baby Weems segment, there are storyboards with a tiny bit of motion included to keep it from being entirely static. There are quick cuts, camera movements, and narration to carry the short all the way to the end. After seeing this, Anderson believed he could use this bare-bones style to have notoriously expensive animation make financial sense for television. He partnered with Jay Ward, and the two created the Crusader Rabbit shorts for NBC. The shorts were successful and ran for several years, which sparked Anderson and Ward to create the cartoons that they were famous for, Rocky and Bullwinkle and Dudley Do-Right. Despite their massive success, their partnership didn't end well. In fact, it got worse even though Ward was already dead. Alex Anderson, animator. I was uh, surprised that to discover that, that my 50% equity in the characters had disappeared and was not being honored. Yeah, I, I went to court and sued and got them to acknowledge that I was the creator. I learned about it at his funeral when, when I was doing a eulogy and the names of several of us who were doing a eulogy were indicated, and it had said Alex Anderson, creator of Bullwinkle and Rocky, and somebody had scratched it out and said an artist who worked for Jay Ward, and I thought, well, what's this? Why is this? And then I started checking, and I found that, indeed, uh, Jay had registered the characters in his name. The show's limited animation technique was taken by Hanna-Barbera, and updated with better animation to produce several hits like Rough and Ready, Huckleberry Hound, and eventually The Flintstones, a primetime hit for ABC in 1960. Hanna-Barbera went on to an unprecedented run of hits, and non-hits. But when it came to television animation, Hanna-Barbera was in a class of their own. However, things fell off in the 1980s. In those years, the Smurfs were their only big hit. This left a gaping hole in the market, 
that was filled by cartoons based on toys, like G.I. Joe and He-Man, but their ratings were drooping as well. And then something happened that had never happened before. During the entire history of television animation from 1949 to 1984, the most famous animation company in the world never produced a single animated television cartoon. That was about to change with a single brunch. But the events leading up to that brunch showed an American titan in peril. Walt Disney was dead to begin with. He died in 1966, but he was still running the company from his grave. After all, the company's internal motto was what would Walt do? But hypothesizing about what a genius would do is not the same as having the genius actually there. Because when it came to the question of what would Walt do, the company wasn't guessing correctly. Even though it was 1984, its last motion picture hit had been The Love Bug in 1968. And so, because the company no longer had Walt, it figured the next best thing was Ron Miller, an ex-Ram quarterback, and Walt's son-in-law, who became CEO in 1978. The best quote to describe Miller's tenure was his own. Because of Walt, because of his influence, I second-guess myself all the time. Miller wasn't only contending with Walt's legacy, he was also dueling with E. Carden Walker, who was the chairman of the board. Walker had been one of Walt's right-hand men. He was in charge of advertising and public relations, and in his tenure, Walker launched the Disney Channel, opened Epcot, and Disneyland Tokyo. But he also had picadillos that were killing the company. Walker was not in favor of a $1 parking fee. The parking lot is the first thing the guests see. We have to keep our prices low. And despite having been in charge of advertising, Walker did not believe in advertising or marketing. The Disney parks did not run ads or commercials. For some perspective, the first American newspaper advertisement was in 1704. In 1922, Queensboro Corps buys airtime from AT&T to create the first radio commercials in advertising history. The first TV ad was aired for Belova watches in 1941 which cost $9. Advertising was not new, and yet E. Carden Walker wouldn't do it. In fact, Walker was even stingy on advertising when it came to the motion picture division. Budgets for advertising were growing since the big blockbuster Jaws. E.T. had cost $10 million in ads alone. But when Disney's Tron came out, they gave it such a minuscule advertising budget that no one knew the film was even out. The film took a $17 million write-down. While all this was going on, there was another heir to the Disney throne, who was dubbed the Idiot Nephew by Uncle Walt himself, who once said, my nephew will never amount to anything. Thanks to Walt Think inside the studio, Roy Disney was considered the village idiot. It didn't help that he wasn't the most charismatic individual. John Sanford, director, Home on the Range. He had this legacy kind of handed to him, and I think he really took it seriously. But on the other hand, he was just a normal guy who happened to have a ton of money. We were in Laverne, California, I think it was, at this movie theater doing a preview for Home on the Range, and there was a Bed Bath & Beyond, and Patty suddenly turns to Roy and says, oh, Roy, they've got glasses on sale. Do you mind if I go looking? Hey, go ahead, Patty. And Patty runs into the Bed Bath & Beyond, and he says, you know, we need to get new glasses. You know, you've got kids, and they break all the glasses, and so suddenly it's 20 years later, and you don't have one glass that matches, so Patty wants new glasses. and. He's just talking very frankly like that. And I said, yeah, I know, that. I know that, how that goes. And then Patty comes running out. Oh, Roy, they've got a wonderful set of glasses that are on sale. Let's go in and get them. And Roy goes, well, I don't want to carry them all over the goddamn mall. And she goes, OK, I guess we'll get them later. And so <laughs> it was just fun to watch them because it was like reminded me of watching my grandparents bicker. Roy didn't like his role at the company nor constantly being at odds with Miller. So Roy left in 1977, but remained on the board. From afar, he watched the animation division go to hell, which was once the company's crown jewel. On Miller's watch, the fox and the hound was almost torpedoed when soon-to-be legendary animator Don Bluth left the studio after run-ins with Miller and the executives. And Bluth didn't leave alone. He took 15 animators with him. At the time, Ed Hansen, the head of the animation department, said this. The whole animation department could have gone under at that time. As it was, we made it, but the release of the film has been delayed, and we lost half of our creative staff. Bluth had his own thoughts. The thing that would help Disney the most is to have a living profit, not a committee. 
They need somebody who knows and cares about animation. They won't roll up their sleeves and plunge in like Walt did. They want to hire somebody to do it. It just doesn't work that way. I think they've found that out now. It was a matter of constantly bumping up against Ron Miller and the older guys. People who wouldn't relinquish authority and who wouldn't make a decision except by committee. It just doesn't work that way. They had some of the best talent in the world there, but if a production head doesn't have talent or push, you won't make it. In spite of everything, the company did have some good news. Miller had gone against the Disney Brain Trust and was making adult fare with his newly created Touchstone Pictures. And he had a huge hit on his hands with Ron Howard's Splash on March 9th, 1984. It just also happened to be the same day that Roy Disney decided to resign from the board. Roy Disney's resignation set off a chain reaction. Corporate raiders tried to take over the company. Miller was forced out. Walker retired. Roy took a vice chairman and chairman of animation role. Michael Eisner became CEO and chairman of the board. Frank Wells became president. And Jeffrey Katzenberg took the role of Walt Disney Studios chairman. And the corporate raiders were turned away. Eisner and Katzenberg had blazed a trail at Paramount and became the talk of the town for their track record and by throwing their names into the press as much as humanly possible. Meanwhile, Frank Wells had been vice chairman of Warner Brothers. They set about using their industry experience to transform a company that was run like a mom and pop shop. The fourth member of their team was assets. And there were assets galore that Disney simply wasn't utilizing to their full potential or at all. The Walt Disney Company was like the drowning man in the flood who doesn't accept help from a rowboat, motorboat, or helicopter because he believes God will save him. The man dies and he meets God and asks, why didn't you come to my rescue? God says, I sent you a rowboat, motorboat, and a helicopter. What do you want from me? Now Eisner, Wells, and Katzenberg would take the rowboat, motorboat, and helicopter to the promised land. Under their leadership, the company began advertising its parks. Attendance rose 10%. They raised the price of admission, which led to hundreds of millions of dollars into the company's coffers. Eisner releases Disney classics on home video. It was initially sacrilegious in the company, but money talks. Cinderella alone made $180 million in revenue. Animation was losing money, so they thought about shutting it down. But Eisner didn't want to piss off Roy, so they kept it around. It was a smart choice, because Roy was a little bit more cunning than he seemed. He was no Richard III, but he had just usurped his own brother-in-law. And because Eisner would later fail to keep him happy, Roy would take out Eisner decades later. Roy might have been treated like Fredo, but he was secretly Michael Corleone. But that was a long way off. Now Eisner was simply basking in his good fortune. Such a bounty has fallen in my lap. Every day a new asset falls out of the sky. The real estate is just gravy. There are 40 unused acres next to Disneyland planted in strawberries. To re-emphasize his life on Easy Street, he was drinking a milkshake when he said that. And of course, there was another blue ocean opportunity for Eisner to slurp up, animated television. On Eisner's first day at the studio, he announced he wanted to have a Disney TV cartoon on the air in 10 months. Willie Ito, animator. We knew internally at Disney that things are going to start happening. And so one day they had all of the Burbank employees meet in the uh, backstage set. We had a big uh, open set area and everyone from the studio was there. And Michael Eisner was introduced and uh, the whole bit. Then he gave us the uh, overall picture as to what to expect in the future now that the new regime is here and one of the things he commented on was we're going to out Hanna-Barbera Hanna-Barbera according to the New York Times he asked someone to find him the six most creative people at Disney to figure out how to make Disney TV animation work which leads to the aforementioned brunch that started it all one of the creatives brought to the table was Jim Magon Magon had produced story records for Disney music for eight years why bring a record producer with no animation experience to the table? I ask myself that every morning when I wake up. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a bit amazing. Well, one of the things that Michael Eisner did before he was at Paramount was, uh, I think he was head of uh, ABC Children's Programming. I think he told me that he 
was the guy who actually bought the Scooby-Doo franchise from Hanna-Barbera, which, of course, is still running after all these years. So that was very successful. And I think he always had a soft spot for TV animation. And so when he took over the company in 84, one of the first things he wanted to do was to start a TV animation department. So being new to the company, I think he just looked at different departments and said, I want to meet some of the bright people that are doing things here at the company. And we had just um, made a lot of money off of Mickey Mouse Disco and, and a lot of projects that were new at the time in the record business. And so Gary Kreisel, who was the president of Disneyland Records, and myself were invited over to Michael Eisner's house on a Sunday morning. Michael Eisner invited a bunch of people, not a lot, I think, there were about 12 in all that were at this meeting in his living room on a Sunday morning in Bel Air. And uh, I had never been to Bel Air, never been invited to someone's house up there. So it was very fancy schmancy for me. And there was also Tad Stones, who began his work at Disney in 1974. He was an uncredited animator on The Fox and the Hound as late as 1981. And now he, too, was at the brunch. I was in features. I eventually moved into story went to Imagineering and helped design rides for Epcot Center, came back in charge of some Epcot Center documentaries that then never happened, eventually ended up back in features. I'm not sure they knew what to do with me. And that's about the time uh, management changed with Michael Eisner coming in and Jeffrey Katzenberg and those guys. And I was along my travels through the company, I had done some uh, animation development for the guys over in the merchandising side of things because they felt like the only way to really sell toys is to have some cartoons on TV. You can't wait for these features that come out every four years or so because that's what it was at the time. Anyway, those same guys were pitching TV animation to Michael Eisner. I was actually on vacation, but I got a call that said, we know you're on vacation, we know it's going to be Sunday, but would you mind coming to Michael Eisner's house to talk about television animation? So it's like, yeah, I think I can make time. Um, went there with like 10 people. These were the guys who basically I had worked with before and they had, were impressed with what I had done. And from the beginning, Michael Eisner felt like Disney is the top name in animation and it should be in every area that animation is in. It doesn't mean that television animation is going to look like feature animation, but it should be the best TV shows in animation on TV. Jim Magon. Michael revealed that he wanted to start this new department. You know, he wanted to, us to come up with some ideas and whatnot, and he actually came up with an idea himself, which was his kids who were in the other room eating cereal in the kitchen in their pajamas. <laughs> on Sunday morning. I uh, had just come back from camp and uh, I guess they had told him that they were eating these really cool candies called gummy bears. And he said, I just like the sound of that. And he looked at me, which was really weird because he didn't know me at all. And he said, make me a show called gummy bears. And I thought, what the, why did he pick me out? <laughs> this button, you know? I said, oh yeah, cool. Yeah, great. So I pitched an old project, Mickey and the Space Pirates. They liked it a lot, but then they said, no, Mickey, we want to make sure we can pull this off. Mickey is too precious. So there was a lot of respect there going in. No one was prepared to actually pitch shows. I had that artwork left over from stuff I had pitched to the merchandising guys who were in the room. But it was kind of more feeling what Eisner wanted. But Tad was at that meeting, and he didn't come over for probably a full season to TV animation. But he eventually did, and thank God he did, because, you know, he, he worked on so many shows over there. But, yeah, he was at that initial meeting. And he had a lot of great ideas, but he, he didn't come join us right away. And uh, afterward, we all met at a coffee shop in Brentwood, and, uh, and I remember us all kind of looking at each other like, this guy's crazy. You know, who, who wants to do a show about characters that get eaten every week? You know? <laughs> and I remember saying, well, he seemed pretty sharp, and respectful of animation, except for that idea about gummy bears. That's like doing pepperoni people or something. I don't, I don't know how to do that. So I think we all kind of felt like, you know, he's a busy man, this will all go away. It was about two weeks later, I got a call. So where's my show? <laughs> well, uh, I'm writing it now. <laughs> and I typed up something and it was horrendous, but uh, it was the beginnings of development. And uh, so I ended up uh, at one point doing two jobs. I was still doing my uh, record producing, and, but I was also developing two shows, well, both Wuzzles and uh, Gummy Bears for Disney. 
and we didn't even have offices for the department back then. Uh, I remember we went over to a fellow named Lenny Ripp. Uh, Lenny Ripp was responsible for uh, creating Full House, and he was under contract at Disney for the time. And Lenny uh, said, come on over, let's, let's talk about this. And <laughs> so there was Gary Kreisel, who was going to be the president of the new division. So he was doing double duty at the same time. Uh, with records and, and uh, TV animation. And Michael Webster turned out to be our office manager. And it was me. And that was the four of us sitting there <laughs> around a, a card table in Lenny's office, kicking ideas around. And that's, uh, that's how that department started. Very bizarre and very humble. I remember having to take pitches from people and, you know, we were discouraged from doing that because Disney became a big company and had deep pockets and, of course, people would come in and pitch and then say, you stole my ideas and so pretty much kept to ourselves and almost all the development was from inside, from uh, people on staff. So we didn't, you know, it was in the time of Barsupalami and, you know, other people pitching their ideas from outside. They, there was a travel office for Disney across the street from the studio in Buena Vista, and uh, it was just a crummy old office building. And I think that's where we put Art Vitello when they brought him in to run Gummy Bears. And, you know, they were just sort of makeshift offices. They put some of the artists on the back lot above the tea room. We were just spread all over. So, you know, we were, we all became sort of bastard children. This is the great book of gummy what's in it well we really don't know well they actually developed gummy bears kind of on a candy basis uh with a villain called licorice whip i think and they were actually going to have the gummy bears give dental hygiene messages at the end of every show that went nowhere and they threw it all out and came up with what was on the air instead of candy the show got a complicated 500 year old plus mythos the gummy bears were descendants of the great gummies, tasked with protecting all things gummy from human greed and exploitation. I was very fortunate that I got to work with two of my childhood heroes, which were Rocky and Bullwinkle. I found myself staring at Bill Scott a lot because, you know, besides doing all the voices of, you know, George of the Jungle and Tom Slick and, and, uh, and, and Bullwinkle, he was a fantastic writer. And he had written all of these, you know, commercials for uh, Quaker Oats, you know, Quisp and Quake and Captain Crunch and stuff like that. He once said to me, you know, the old story, Jim, about uh, how do you make a statue of an elephant? Well, you start with a block of granite and you chip away everything that doesn't look like an elephant. He says, but writing a script is different. You start with nothing and you chip away until you have a story. <laughs> And I thought, oh, that's interesting. You don't even have the rock to work with. <laughs> and uh, I just thought he was a delight. You know, he died after the first season of, of Gummy Bears, and uh, it was just devastating for us. Welcome to the land of Was, where nobody is like anybody you've seen before. The people who live in Was are called Wuzzles, naturally. And as you probably guessed, wuzzles are a little bit, um, you know, different. I, I didn't stay on wuzzles. You know, when once we got the two shows sold, I stayed, you know, exclusively on gummy bears. But in the early days, we were trying to put together these shows to, to pitch to the networks. And we had a show called Jumble Isle. The idea was that there were these animals that were jumbled up. There were, you know, two of, of each animal. And lo and behold, it turns out Hasbro has already has a project called the Wuzzles, which were like plush animals at the time. And and again, I don't know the ins and outs of the you know, business side, but you know, it was decided, you know, well, why create these things when they they already exist? And let's just do a deal with Hasbro to um, take our development and put it with their characters, which I'm not even sure they had much of a backstory. But once the deal was made, then we developed them into, you know, talking, breathing, living characters. <laughs> and so what happened was that Puzzles then went on to, you know, have its own production department, just like Gummy Bears had. But like I said, my involvement at that point, uh, I had dropped out after it sold to CBS. Besides Wuzzles and Gummy Bears, Disney television animation had one more venture in its early years. Fluffy Dogs was the first animated Disney feature for television. The show revolved around the fluffy dogs going through an interdimensional portal to Earth. 
It got a 5.3 rating on November 27, 1986. The numbers were so low that it killed off the idea for a television series based on the special. And with that, Fluffy Dogs was over before it even really got started. Fluffy Dogs was sort of the, um, what can I call it, the, the albatross around the neck, you know, of <laughs> the ancient mariner. Uh, it, it, was, it was a cross to bear. I think everybody in, this, in the department worked on it at one time or another. And so what happened was is that, you know, we were going to do this fluffy special, and it was going to be the kickoff for our series. And it just never took off. It never, you know, just never happened. But I think we were all kind of glad it didn't go any further. Um, I mean, they were, they were cute, but I, I just remember it being like, oh, crap, I don't, I don't want to go on another meeting about fluffy dogs. <laughs> We've been to so many worlds. I don't know how long it's been since I've seen my family. You can talk. I wish you wouldn't keep saying that. I've been talking since I was three. I'm sorry, but I mean, talking dogs, uh, fluffies, and doorways to other worlds? I just want to find one world, my world. Disney was going in cheap in terms of the price for pristine Disney animation. Disney knew they couldn't afford movie quality animation and expect to make a profit. But Disney still spent 285000 on each episode of Wuzzles. That was double what Hanna-Barbera would spend. It was so much, in fact, that it was $35,000 more than it was being paid by CBS. Why spend so much? The reasoning was simple. If it looked better than everything else on TV, then the characters could become part of the parks. And because of the success rate of their recent films, Disney needed characters more than ever. Willie Ito, animator. When I was at Hanna-Barbera, Michael Eisner was the VP of Children's Programming at ABC. So when we were doing presentation and they would fly out here to review what we were working on, Joel would ask us to come in on a Saturday, sit out at our desk as if we were busy bees, and then bring Michael Eisner and his people through and says, hey, here, look, they're all working on the new show idea, and then see the presentation. So I knew of Michael Eisner. And so when he says he's going to Oh, Hanna-Barbera, Hanna-Barbera, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I came back to Disney to get away from this rat where it's, and I hope, uh, you know, we're not going to be all, all caught up in the middle of it. Well, to make a long story short, a few months later, a fellow named Michael Webster, who I worked with in animation, was hired on to be a production coordinator for the newly forming Disney TV animation. Michael got with me and says, how would you like to come back to animation? I said, Michael, no, please don't, don't, don't do this to me. I'm perfectly happy. I'm actually in my new career, you know, back at Disney. And he says, well, you know, we're going to have a little boutique operation. All we're going to do is be responsible for the scripts and we'll do storyboards and maybe character design. But otherwise, everything is going to be farmed out to a production house. So we're just going to have a little boutique operation. And let me dangle this carrot in front of you. What it was is, he says, I know you used to make a lot of trips to uh, Japan and Asia, and you know a lot of the production houses over there. So I want to send you there and um, meet with these different companies and talk business, you know. And... uh, he says, well, we'll be sending you first class. You stay at the Imperial Hotel in Tokyo. And, you know, the, how could I resist? Plus the fact that there was a handsome increase because of my position would be uh, like an executive thing. Michael, I'm going to give you three months. That's what I could promise you. So, okay, that's the deal. I did the pilot storyboard for a two-minute pilot. The soundtrack was recorded. They cut the exposure sheets and the whole bit. And with those two copies under my arm, I flew to Tokyo. As I was registering, this American gentleman approaches me. So, are you Mr. Ito? I said, yeah. He says, oh, hey, um, I understand you're here to make pilot films for your fledging Disney 
TV animation. I said, yeah, I am. You, you could talk to me initially, but the decision will be Michael Webster, who will be arriving here in about half an hour. So we sat in the lobby having a cocktail, and then Michael shows up, and he's at the desk, and I said, well, there's Michael now. So we flag him over, and he says, the fellow talking to us says, what we want to do is we want to throw our hat in the ring. I understand you're going to be talking to people at Toy Animation in Tokyo. Then you're going to be flying to Korea, and you're going to be meeting with uh, Steve Han, uh, at the Korean studio. I said, well, we, we only have two sets of soundtrack, exposure sheets, and copies of uh, the layouts and storyboards. She said, no, no problem, you know, they can make t copies of the, all that. So, okay, what do you think, Michael? And Michael said, yeah, sure, why not? So we awarded them to also do a pilot. Three months later, the three studios submitted their two-minute pilot. So the three pilots came in. We all go in the sweat box. All the executives are there. I think even Roy Disney Jr. was sitting in on it. And uh, all of the newly appointed executives of the newly formed Disney TV animation. So we sit there and number one. <laughs> Number two, da, 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 da. then number three, then the lights go on. And then now we have to say which one we liked, and uh, it was unanimous. We liked this one, say, number two, you know. Well, it turned out that that was produced by a company named Tokyo Movie Shinsha. It had nothing to do with the other two that we submitted. But this one had the rich full animation and all that, so they got the contract. So TMS is the producing company. TMS, they later did the uh, uh, Little Nemo in Slumberland feature also, you know, and so they had access to a lot of young Disney animators with full animation training to work on their projects. As a matter of fact, even that two minute pilot, they. <laughs> They sort of farmed out some of the animation to Disney animators. That's why it showed such quality and it beat out the Koreans and the Japanese studio. They cheated. <laughs> but in essence, you know, they Disney kept striving to get the utmost in animation quality, which is good, you know, because that was one of my concerns. If Disney gets into TV animation, are they going to lose their integrity by just schlocking it out and doing limited animation and all that? But, um, you know, the quality is there. Jim Magon. I remember we did a lot of tests uh, with other studios. We ended up with, uh, at least for coming years, we ended up with TMS, Tokyo Movie Sinsha. I can remember... I, I was really used to looking at Hamburger Bear sort of animation, which is, you know, you move across the proscenium left, right, oh, 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 you know, <laughs> the background that keeps repeating. And, you know, that's sort of what we grew up with and were used to. And I remember the first episode of Gummy Bears, I, I saw uh, Sir Tuxford ride his horse into camera. You know, the horse came to camera. You know, he did a full turnaround, which you never saw in TV animation. <laughs> it was like, holy cow, look at what happened, you know. <laughs> and it was a, a real leap in, in the animation quality. And uh, I remember talking to Carl Gears, who was working over at, I think he was at Filmation at the time, and he eventually came over to Disney to do... Uh, the Winnie the Pooh show, and he said everyone in other studios was talking about, did you see what Disney did on Saturday morning? Oh my God, you know. So uh, the quality really raised the bar. Now, true, it wasn't feature animation, but it was a big jump in quality. Finally, they put us all together over at the Coenga building, which was on Coenga near uh, Universal Studios. And it just got bigger and bigger as we added more and more people. So on the one hand, you know, we weren't on the lot anymore. The sort of good news was Nobody was looking over our shoulders. So that department started and grew and made its success sort of, you know, off by itself. Nobody was actually sitting down reading our scripts and saying, gee, I don't think this is very Disney or I don't think, <laughs> you know, there just wasn't any interference because they had other and bigger fish to fry. You know, we went off and sold our first two shows, Wuzzles and Dummy Bears, to uh, CBS and NBC respectively. And it just took off from there. Willie Ito. We had our own growing pains within 
the studio, getting uh, people together, finding a crew of a good animator, story of bit people. And before that three months was up, I could see the frenetic pace. We were moving from office to office because it was like we move in and then there's, you know, it's not enough room because we're uh, expanding our staff. And I'm thinking, what happened to the boutique operation? Now we're going to have a whole staff. And then uh, am I going to have to do what I did at San Rio is, is, you know, manage this crew of people and all that. So I, I started feeling the, uh, pressure of that uh, position. But in the meanwhile, I, I went back to Carson and Carson Van Austin, who was my boss in consumer products. And I said, Oh Jesus, it's the same old thing. I, you know, it's, I'm, I'm going before I get too caught up into it, can I come back? So he said, Oh yeah, there's always uh, you know, opening for you to come back. So I came back to consumer products, but I, stayed you know with the disney tv uh, as far as merchandise and byproducts and whatever else you know but i was now out of the uh, production rat race tad stones anyway i went back to features and uh, pitched some stuff and actually was considering leaving the company and maybe just you know freelancing and then going into more actually science fiction short stories and novels. I met one of the guys who was then the head of the TV department that was just starting and mentioned, hey, do you have any freelance opportunities? And he said, oh, well, I don't know if you want to do that. Why don't you come visit? And I came visit their very small building. And uh, he introduced me around. He said, yeah, Tad may be coming over here. Actually, I think he said Tad would be coming over here. And I just was quiet. I didn't know what he was talking about. But they... Uh, ultimately brought me over to be uh, the creative manager of the department in which I was supposed to take pitches and come up with stories. And actually I was supposed to take pitches more than come up with stuff, but I wasn't geared that way. And uh, we had a gong show coming up with Michael and Jeffrey, which is you do like a two sentence description of a show and they either like it or not. And I think we pitched 22 ideas. I think 18 of them were mine. And it's not like they were fully developed. It was like, hey, uh, Trojan birds and Legionnaire cats. You know, the city of Troy is up in trees and like Roadrunner and Coyote. And they gong. Anyway, Gummy Bears had been through two seasons. You know, it was run by Art Vitello and, and created by Art Vitello and Jim Magon. And Jim had had no animation experience before that. Disney just said, hey, if you want the show, this is the guy who's going to do it. So there was always a contentious relationship there. And by the third season, NBC said, we want to change. And they tapped me and Jim went on to, I think, DuckTales development at that point. Anyway, so that's how I got to Gummy Bears. It was just kind of like, hey, you <laughs> over here. And... You know, that started me story editing and producing. Willie Ito. But the question always was, well, how come Wuzzles and Gummy Bears when Disney has such a stable of great characters that they could work from, you know? But I, I think initially they says, well, we're going to be making cartoons for Saturday morning. And that's a lesser market quality wise. And we don't want to ruin Disney's image by turning out the limited animation with Mickey Mouse and all that. So let's go with new characters. But then the shows were a hit and it started to see that Disney TV was getting some recognition. And so Roy Disney said, well, you know, come on, let's let's use some of our own characters. That way the, the market and the... Uh, the kids will gravitate to it, knowing it's uh, what you know a, a known Disney character. So we did Ducktales. Jim Magon. After two seasons of Gummy Bears, I moved over to work on Ducktales, which was a, a big deal at the time. You know, we were doing this as a syndicated program as opposed to a network program, and uh, it had already been developed. Ted and Nasty and Patsy Cameron were always three episodes. Patsy Cameron and Nasty, and Ted and Nasty, writers. 
my career in writing really started when I met my future husband, Ted. I that was, would be me. I was 18, and I auditioned for Walt Disney's new Mickey Mouse Club as a performer, and Ted was a writer for Walt Disney and chose me in an audition, and I appeared on the new Mickey Mouse Club singing and performing sign language, and then I fell madly in love with him, Ted, and uh, started writing him love letters. And Didn't spell my name right, though, so... <laughs> During our union break, uh, and I'm um, sitting on a bench back when I did smoke cigarettes, and the guy from the mailroom comes to me and goes, is your name Abashi? And I went, no, no, it's a nasty. He goes, well, I think somebody's been writing you a bunch of letters. Uh, we got in the, in the mailroom, they didn't know where to deliver them. So and I discovered that um, she had an interest in me. Yeah, and then he said, when he called me, he said, you're really funny. He thought my love letters were funny, and he said, I think you could be a writer. And Ted showed me Mickey Mouse Club scripts and taught me how to write scripts. And then um, then I moved up here to Los Angeles, and my first job was a freelance for Hanna-Barbera on a show called Casper and the Space Angels. And I freelanced for a couple years and then became a staff writer on the Smurfs. And I was the first first woman staff writer at Hanna-Barbera and as well as their youngest at the time at age 23. And then a little bit later, Ted started writing for the Smurfs and we became story editors together. Margaret Lush, who approved my very first cartoon episode on Casper and the Space Angels, Margaret Lush, noticed that we had fun together when we wrote, not knowing we were dating or anything. And Margaret, she teamed us up as story editors on the Smurfs and then Ted and I wrote on the Smurfs for three years, when which it won one Emmy, and then the next show that we did was DuckTales for Walt Disney. DuckTales was based on the Carl Barks comic book stories about the world adventurer ducks of Duckburg, Scrooge McDuck and his nephews. The comics were a hit back in the 1940s and 50s, and their comic adventure styling seemed a perfect fit for what Disney envisioned for its television programs. Barks was never really consulted, said Tom Rizika, associate producer on DuckTales. He continued, although the show was initially based on the concept of doing Scrooge McDuck and the Nephews, we discovered that a lot of stuff that made wonderful comics wouldn't translate into the 80s or into animation. So we started evolving new characters and other things to contemporize the show. As we did that, the stories got further and further away from the comics, although a few episodes are lifted right out of them. We had a meeting with uh, Gary Kreisel where he showed us two projects, DuckTales, and a special called Fluffy Dogs, and we chose DuckTales. So that, that was a good choice. They hired us because they knew it would be a big show with lots of episodes. We got known as people who could do 65 half hours in a season and stuff like that. Or 90 like, minutes on the Smurfs. Our first year as story editors, we'd never story edited before. It was 90 minutes because it was such a hit. Or on DuckTales, it was 65 half hours. People would say, how come you're not freaking out? You know, and, and um, I just knew we would get it done. But Ted, his energy and his dedication, I credit a lot of it to him. Look, boys, we make a great team, but I owe it to your Uncle Donald not to have you gallivanting around the world with me. But you're going to need someone besides Launchpad. And it looks like I found him. Your uncle has a three-day pass while his ship is in Panama. Oh, treasure hunting and a visit with Uncle Donald? It's not fair. Sorry, boys, but I have to do what's best. Do I get a hug goodbye? All right, but I'll miss you. You know, they were definitely based on the Carl Barks books, but the main thing we had to do was, again, bring the heart, you know, bring heart out. Well, one day, certain executives said, you're not following the books very closely. And we said, we have 65 episodes to do, and Carl Barks only wrote 16, and they weren't that different from one another. Jim Magon. The idea came up, why don't we do a miniseries that we can cut into a movie we can then show as a pilot, a kickoff to the series. So what was really fascinating for me anyway was even though the show was already in production, was to get to do the episodes that 
set the tone for the series. So the first thing that the public was going to see was this five-parter. And oh, we just had so much fun putting that together because it had to work as five separate episodes, but it had to work as an overarching big story as well so that it could be shown as a movie. And I have a picture of uh, Mark Zasloff and, and Bruce Talkington and I getting in front of this chalkboard that has this gigantic story outline on it of all five episodes. And it was like, are we going to be able to do this? <laughs> and it turned out spectacular. I was very happy with it. A lot of the episodes, you know, went to Japan, the earlier ones, and the animation was just exquisite. It was so exciting to have the films come back, especially the earliest episodes. Wow. I mean, dazzling animation, like A-Team animation. They had a party, and they showed one of the fully realized episodes. It was called Duckman of Alcatraz. It was really, really sensational. So I remember even Tad saying, I didn't really realize how good this was. I think we, that no one really understood that. I don't think I did until it, the episodes started to come back with all the music, fully animated, everything. And then when it debuted, you know, it was a really, really big smash. Meanwhile, the L.A. Times' Charles Solomon was not impressed by DuckTales. In fact, he found it rather distasteful. Mickey Mouse, Donald Duck, and other Disney cartoon stars owe their popularity and longevity to the fact that they were so well animated they ceased to exist as drawings on screen and emerged as clearly recognizable characters. By breaking with that tradition in DuckTales, the new management at Disney Studio is risking far more than the $20 million it has invested in the series. At stake is a name that has been synonymous with the best in animation for 60 years. But the risk of ruining their name in animation was well worth it because the show was gigantic. DuckTales was big, really big. The series was in 56 countries and seen by 25 million kids each day. It went so far that it doubled the ratings of kids' shows that it was in competition with. Even though each episode cost $275,000, Disney more than made its money back, and Disney television animation had finally, truly arrived. Tad Stones. Well, DuckTales was, was a huge thing because you know, a Saturday morning show is just your first order is 13 and then maybe 10 the second season, then eight and eight, and then you're lucky if you're still on. DuckTales suddenly it was like, no, we're doing 65 episodes. George Lucas told us once that DuckTales was to syndication as Star Wars was to movies. I mean, it was huge. Patsy Cameron and Nasty and Ted and Nasty. We finished DuckTales, and they didn't pick up our contract. They figured, you know, find somebody cheaper, I guess. I don't know. Oh, well, actually, no. I, let me, I would like to differ with that. It was a smash, and that was a wonderful thing for our career. They offered us Aladdin, actually, and we, I mean, I think we had always wanted to develop, like kind of be in developing new shows, and when uh, Nelvana offered us Vice Presidents of Development, we took that, and they were just starting out, kind of. They had done some things, but Beetlejuice um, really was their first big blockbuster. So I think they did offer us Aladdin after that, and then later, Little Mermaid. We're sitting in a restaurant, and here the guys from Disney, the executives, end up sitting behind us. And we were with ABC at the time. When uh, the girls from ABC went to the ladies' room, the guys from Disney leaned over and said, we need you back. We need you back on our show because um, – we can't get anybody that's doing a good job, so we went back and... Uh... Yeah, we spent three years on Little Mermaid, which was, again, very, very wonderful experience. And they wanted really us good. for five years, but we said, well, maybe just one year at a time. So we stayed there for 14 years, just one year at a time. Jim Magon. I know that I was a big Carl Barks fan growing up just as a kid reading the comic book. And so we owed so much to Carl Barks creating the Beagle Boys and Gerald Gearless and Magic of the Spell and all these characters. And I felt bad that he never got any credit on the series. So one of the episodes I wrote was based on one of his comic book stories. I actually gave him credit as story by Carl Barks, script by Jim Bang on, you know, because I wanted his name in there somewhere on the series. There were two things that were key to uh, DuckTales. One is Scrooge McDuck was torn between the cold, hard cash and the warmth of his heart for his family, his nephews. That's what was always driving the series, was this man caught between the cold and, and, the, and the heat. The second thing was, young children don't understand money. You know, it's just like the coins of different sizes and paper, and they honestly, it 
don't have a concept of how money works. But Karl Barks was a genius when it came to, well, what do kids understand? Well, they understand the tactile quality of coins. And so to have a money bin full of coins that you were able to dive into and you know <laughs> swim through like a porpoise and, you know and and what just that's what kids could understand and and appreciate and the fact that he gave Scrooge McDuck that childlike quality to be able to uh, enjoy his money in a very tactile way I think was a real breakthrough for the character Carl Barks an excerpt from the Duck Man an interview with Carl Barks 1975 the office, I think, wanted me to do a Christmas story, and so I uh, was casting around for Christmas stories. I began to think of the great Dickens Christmas story about Scrooge. It is the classic of all Christmas stories. So I just was a thief enough to sort of steal some of the idea and uh, have a rich uncle for Donald. Well, he had turned out to be kind of an interesting character in that first story, and so I began thinking of uh, a way to use him again. I guess the fact that he was rich was the thing that triggered all further developments is just how rich, and uh, the showing of his wealth. And I found that that was quite a fascinating subject, just piles of money, it seemed to appeal to a lot of people. and. Uh, I just gradually made him richer and richer, and then I had to develop a place where he could store the money. And, and all the time, uh, there were the Beagle Boys trying to steal it from him. Those things just grew like building brick walls. You just lay one brick on top of another, and finally you got a whole thing built. You can't dive into a pile of money like you would into a snowdrift. So uh, he had to have a trick by which he did it. And I don't explain that trick because I don't understand it myself. He, he can go out in the desert and he can smell the presence of gold. <laughs> Other prospectors would have to dig mountains of dirt before they could find any nuggets, but he can smell them. I think he represents something that nearly everybody wishes they could be sometime in their life just a little bit too rich. Disney had another project that was budding at ABC. Disney had a long, strange history with this character, with lawsuit after lawsuit. But the character was about to become part of Saturday Mornings in 1988, with an unlikely candidate to help lead it. Mark Zaslov, writer. Uh, what happened was I went to Cal Berkeley as a eventually theoretical astrophysics person. But I was also writing at the time, and I had a buddy. We were doing live action. So every summer, he was at UCLA. I was at Cal. We'd come back, and we'd write a script or something. And then I wrote my first novel over there. And then it was like, well, what am I going to do also for money? I was doing magazine work. I, I worked at uh, for Larry Flint for about seven months, Meteoric Rise and Fall on Hustler and couple of magazines like that, which was fun. I used to say, though, I was karmically balanced because I did Pooh and Hustler. By the time anybody even asked about it, it was never a big deal. No one cared. I mean, it wasn't like I was posing or anything, you know, where it was going to come back and bite them. Not that I couldn't have. Oh, sorry. <laughs> and I got my first gig in animation while I was there as well. But basically, I went, I got to make some money. It's like, oh, yeah, animation. They need writers. You know, my dad said, yeah, let me try that, you know. And it's like, so I went in not thinking anything of it, really. And it was very easy to do. And so I was doing some freelance work. And I had sent in something, oh, GoBot, a GoBot script to Jim Nagon. And he went, oh, my God, it's the only funny GoBot script I ever read. So I went in, and he'd probably tell you better. I just had this sort of full-of-himself attitude, not in a bad way, according to him, but I just looked back, and it was just kind of funny because he, he went, this is really good writing. And I was kind of like, well, yeah, of course it is. You know, it was like, well, it's animation, you know? I never thought much about it. I learned to very much respect it. I always liked the product, but I was never, like, a fan of animation because I grew up around it, you know? So it was always the discipline. But you have to understand, my dad was an animator, producer, director. So when I was growing up, animators were guys who were drunk on my living room floor. So I get to Disney, and they're all teetotalers, except for a few people. I'm like, you're not animators. I know what animators look like, and none of you are animators. I, I've gotten some bad raps there 
that I didn't do. I was always upset later when people would say, blah, 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 and you were being blah, blah, blah. And I went, I didn't do that. If I'd just known I would have done that, I would have been much more obnoxious. I would have actually caused these problems. I think I could rub some people the wrong way, although everybody could. But there was one day where I don't know why. It was just one of those things where maybe we'd been working too hard too long, you know, and you're near the end of something. And I started taking tape, and I started taping across the hallway. And then somebody threw something on it. It became like a giant spider web that chopped the hallway up. And then people started throwing items onto it so it stuck. And so suddenly there's this whole block tape hallway and people had thrown knickknacks and this and that. And probably Michael Webster or Tom Rizika came by and they're just look at me like, this is your doing, right? And it's like, ah, I'll leave it. And then they walked out because they knew it was a way to blow off steam. But it was one of those almost mash moments where you start off doing something silly and the next thing the entire place is sort of doing it. But uh, I got nailed for things that other people did a lot, you know, where they were nicer and I was more like, ah, whatever, you know. I was certainly taller. And I think ABC wanted a Disney show. And then it became, what do we give them? And then Pooh, because they had mechanical rights, I guess, was a safe thing to do. So I, it was above my pay grade, but I remember that it was ABC wanting, but I think the machinations were, what can we do that's very Disney that we have? And then it became Pooh, and then it came down to us. It was funny. I, I knew it could be really good if we didn't screw it up. And they didn't think I should do it. I was young and I wore long leather jackets before uh, Matrix. You know, I was theoretically a dark character. And so they were questioning me. And I remember sitting at a table, I had to do the entire Bible premise pitch in a three-day weekend and then go have lunch with Gary Kreisel and some other people and, and explain why this show would be great. I remember going, look, I will bet you a year's salary. Unfortunately, they didn't do it. We will win our time slot and be number one. We'll win an Emmy guaranteed. I'll get you my whole year's salary. And we did. We were the only show to do that at that time. But it was one of those where you just go, if you don't screw it up, how can you miss? The designs are good, great characters. Just don't be stupid. You know, write really well and it'll be a good show. I never used anything from the books because it wouldn't have worked for me. It was always, how can I become Milne? And then how do I expand that? For whatever reason, they previewed it on the Disney Channel and then it went to ABC. And then ABC changed their order from 13 to 20 something for the first season. So we were all kind of cranking. That was actually a lot of fun. I, I loved that show. <gasps> Why, thank you, Piglet. It's perfect. <laughs> what is it? That was the first time I was in charge of anything and I actually had to have responsibility and scheduling and everything. And Carl Gears, he was very much pro what I was bringing to the table. And that was a great learning experience. And there was about professionalism and a way of looking at things that Carl had without being blighted or too jaded about it. I mean, Carl was Winnie the Pooh. It just had that sort of attitude. As much as people used to say they'd walk by and we'd be shouting at each other, I don't think we were ever, ever, ever angry. We were just loud. We'd start going, what about this? No, this. And then suddenly, I guess our voices went up. But people would go, we walked by and get Carl's office. And if you're like, we hear you guys shouting. Is everything okay? And I'm like, yeah, what? what's going on? But, you know, you couldn't ask for a better person to, to take in on, you know, on your first thing. We fell through the cracks at that time. They didn't know we were there, really, because DuckTales was getting up to speed. And I remember Carl telling me vividly, he goes, you know, if we're a hit, they're going to suddenly start caring about what we do and give us all sorts of terrible notes. And he was right. Suddenly, everybody wanted a finger in it the second season. And we got a ton more notes. You know, well, we got to do this. Is this good? Should we do that? We don't understand this. Anytime you try to do something, whether it's cutting edge or just very truthful, you know, and I thought the Pooh characters we handled them extremely truthfully. They weren't just saying gag lines. They were saying a line because that's what Pooh would say or that's what Tigger would say, which is the essence of any kind of good writing is, are you telling the truth? And so we get people who wouldn't necessarily understand that. So we'd get notes and then you'd have to explain it. And then that wouldn't necessarily work. And then, you know, it would be weird. I mean, I always had a really good uh, relationship with standards and practices. But I remember <laughs> I wanted Gopher to have a huge cask of black powder because he's a miner and he digs. And I wanted to blow the side off of a mountain. 
And of course, ABC standards and practices says, no, you can't do that. And I tried to explain, well, why? And it's like this, and then kids will do that. And I go, well, I don't think they can get all the dynamite or, you know, black powder. And they're like, well, we can't do it in fire. And so I thought for a while, and just as a joke, I said, well, could he use a thermonuclear device? And they thought for a while, and they go, yeah, that's okay. And so then I brought it to Carl, and Carl thought for a while, and he went, you know, we can't make the bomb look hooish, so we can't use it. But at least I feel like, okay, I got a thermonuclear device approved of for Winnie the Pooh. There's only one thing left to do. You mean? Yes, Rabbit. We must give Piglet a staying inside party. It's like a going away party. <laughs> only different. While Pooh was doing well at ABC, DuckTales remained the number one kids show for two years. Luckily for Disney, when the show was finally toppled, it was by Disney's Chippendale Rescue Rangers. We didn't know this at the time, but I think in Eisner's mind, or whoever was in charge of that, felt like, let's see how the department goes first before we start putting our you know, flagship characters on the television. Because when you look at characters like Mickey and Donald and Pluto and Chip and Dale and whatnot, they were always on the big screen. So to, to suddenly take them and put them on the small screen, I think is, you know, <laughs> you know, whoa, we've got a big star. Let's not put them. Let's not put them on TV. Let's put them in movies, you know, kind of thing. So, yeah, we needed papal dispensation just to put Donald into DuckTales as a cameo to explain why he wasn't in the series. <laughs> he went off to join the Navy and left the nephews with his uncle. I remember we had to get permission to put him in to explain that. Tad Stones. I pitched Miami Mice because Miami Vice was on the air. They liked that a lot because of the name. We called it Metro Mice and did a script for it. Never went past that, although the villain of the script was a character called Fat Cat. We brought back and kind of the idea of mice detectives came back as Chippendale's Rescue Rangers. We had two characters, two little mice called Kit Colby and Colt Chatterson. They were the original Rescue Rangers. And every time we would meet with Eisner and Katzenberg, they'd say, that just is not a home run yet. And uh, then later on, it was like, okay, DuckTales is a huge success. Are there any other Disney classic characters that we should be developing for? And Mickey was like, still too precious. Donald made appearance in DuckTales. He's very hard to animate. Goofy, yes, Goofy's always been the everyman. Definitely develop a bunch of things for Goofy. And then when they got to Chip and Dale, it was Michael Eisen who said, put those guys in that show. And Jeffrey said, home run. And that was Chip and Dale's Rescue Rangers. And that sort of broke the ice for oh, now we can start to put, you know, other characters in them. I guess there's only one thing to say then. Rescue Rangers I felt like on Rescue Rangers, we lost a lot from script to screen because, one, we were working way too fast, throwing things together and not being able to follow up on stuff. The schedule was the same. The problem was on the story side, there was just two of us editing. I literally was working 13, 14 hour days, except for Saturday was an eight hour day. And then Sunday, my day off was four hours. Those hours were at the studio. It wasn't like working at home. There was this particular point of contention that when it came time to do the multi-part pilot, we were told that we had slipped the schedule in some way that we had less time to do the four episodes that are supposed to kick off the show than doing any given four episodes, which made no sense to me. It means we're rushing through the most important thing. So we took our shot at it and we did what we could. And then they took me off the show and I said, you know what, that's fine. There's only 15 episodes to go. I got to do the pilot to set things up. So that's good. But then it turned out they were having people rework the pilot, rewrite it. And they were being given more time to rewrite the pilot than we were given to write it in the first time. And that was too much for me. And I was out the door. Um, <laughs> you know, Disney had certain landmarks in your career give you like a plaque or a ring or a statue. And the two statues I really wanted were <laughs> Mickey as a Sorcerer's Apprentice and Tinkerbell. And Mickey was at, hold on, I have it right here. Uh, I want to say 15 years. Yes, I was about to get that. I was two months away from it. And it was like, that was somehow stupidly enough to make me calm down and went back to work. Jim Magon. It was a very strange time. I was busy, you know, trying to develop Tailspin, and we got this call that Buena Vista Television wanted someone to look at the pilot show that he had done. I think it was a 
four or five parter, just like what we did on DuckTales. I think they wanted someone to come in with fresh eyes and punch it up or do whatever. And it was like, well, I'm in the middle of doing tailspin and, and whatnot. Um, okay, so I said to Mark, look, I, I'm not going to be here to help with tailspin. This will go a lot faster if you help me. So he and I both jumped in and kind of re-edited the pilot movie. And then I think we edited a couple of individual episodes that had been in the works during that time. And finally threw our hands up and said, look, we got to get back on our project. And I think it went to uh, Ken Koontz and David Weimers next. So our time on Rescue Rangers was very brief. But again, I, I never understood why Tad didn't follow through on that. I think it was some decision high above our heads, and I'm not sure why. So it was just like shrug. Okay. By the year 1990, Disney had invested $150 million in television animation, and by 1995 had plans to invest $400 million more. At this point, the output of television animation was prolific. Katzenberg was quoted as saying, Each year we are now producing as much animation as was done in the years 1920 to 1950, when all the classic Disney cartoons were made. These television animation shows had 22,000 full painted cells per episode. Other shows at the time of good quality were averaging 15,000. Once Chip and Dale was another bona fide hit, Disney put plans in motion for television domination, and that plan was simple. It would have a two-hour block of cartoons when kids got home from school. Gummy Bears, DuckTales, Rescue Rangers, and their newest offering, Tailspin. The shows were expensive, and yet Disney wasn't even charging the networks for the shows. Instead, the deal was that Disney would retain the six minutes of advertisements to sell themselves. And this worked like gangbusters. Despite the cost of production and advertising, the Disney afternoon earned the company $40 million a year for a period of time. But this incredible run almost didn't happen because of one pitch. Jim Magon. It didn't last long, but we had a process by which Tad would be developing a show and I'd be producing a show and then I'd be done. So I'd go into development and he would go into production. And we would sort of flip-flop as to what our duties were at TV animation. I was at a point of development and we were creating a show called B Players. And B Players... I thought was kind of a clever idea. It came out at the time of Roger Rabbit, so the idea of all these cartoon characters uh, mingling with live-action people was popular at the time. So we said, well, who's the one character who was, you know, a star in motion pictures and then never worked again? It was Baloo. So we said, oh, here's a guy who should be doing more movies, and he's not. He's stuck on the back lot. And along with him is this kid who turns out to be a nephew, I think, of Mickey Mouse. His name was Ricky Bratt, you know, and Ricky had started in his eyes. He wanted to be as big as his cousin or his uncle, whatever it was. And so the stories were all about Baloo and Ricky trying to convince the powers that be, specifically Michael Eisner as a character in the show. Let us do a Western. Hey, let us do a space show. Hey, let us. And then every week they would be you know, trying some way to get into the next gig and that part of the cast were all of these other people that weren't working anymore, like Horace Horsecollar and Claire Bell Cow and, and whatnot. Every time we pitched it, it just never seemed to stick, you know. And at one point, Katzenberg said to me, if, if you say beat players one more time, I'm going to throw you out the window. <laughs> I was like, well, I guess that project's dead. You know, everything I'd pitched there had pretty much gone. And so we were thinking, this is going to go. But it didn't. It stopped dead. And we were stuck because we had to pitch the next series to all the department heads in Florida. And we had no show. And we had to get into production for the next 65 episodes. And on top of which, it was going to be the linchpin of the Disney afternoon. And I remember Michael Webster, who was not a fan of mine, poked his head in my room and he said, you better come up with a new show real quick or it's going to be Tumbleweed City around here, meaning we're going to fire everyone, you know. And I thought, how did this fall on my shoulders that everyone's future depends on me? Am I that important? And if so, let's see a bigger paycheck <laughs> you know, if I'm that important. So it was like, oh, scratch head, scratch head, what am I going to do? And one of the guys that I had hired at TV Animation was Mark Zaslav. And Mark had gone on to fame and fortune by story editing the Wind of the Pooh show. And so Mark and I did a lot of talking, a lot of collaboration on, on ideas and whatnot. And I said, Mark, come in here. I have an idea. I want to 
chat with you. I want to use you as a sounding board. So what had happened was during DuckTales, one of the early ideas about Launchpad McQuack was that he had a courier service and that he would fly anything anywhere overnight or something like that was his slogan. And so Scrooge McDuck would use him to send things, you know, crazy places. Like, I, I need a whale sent to SeaWorld, you know, in Dubai or something, you know. And that never went anywhere because eventually Launchpad became Scrooge's private pilot. So I said, what if we took Baloo from B Players, who's a really good character, I believe in him, and we took this air cargo service of Launchpad and McQuacks and kind of glued them together so that Baloo is the pilot and he's got this company and it's it's failing because he's a jungle bum bear and he's got this kid you know the typical disney uh, orphan like mowgli who he's got to look out for i said now we're starting to get the dynamic of what drove jungle book so well which was here's a guy who's torn between being a big kid himself and being a father figure and i said i think there's something there and so mark and i kicked it around and and we had some drawings made up, and in three days, we had Tailspin. And we went and pitched it, and it was like, home run. <laughs> so whereas we had pulled our hair out over B players for weeks and months, Tailspin came together very, very quickly. And so Mark and I ended up as the producers on that show. Mark Zaslov. He had pitched B players, and that got shot down, and they didn't have that fourth show to put on, which became the Disney Afternoon. I gather it was a $2 billion pitch. Eventually, that's what they made off of it, with the tailspin. I remember walking in, because I was sort of in the middle of something on Pooh or on a break or something, and it was like, yeah, I tried this. What can we do with these characters? And then three days later, we had tailspin. Tad Stones. Gummy Bears, it was just, I mean, it was cool. We were a very small team. We were still trying to figure out things. It was just a lot of camaraderie in the studio. I mean, there was only, I want to say, like two shows going or, you know, in a special, like a Fluffy Dogs and Gummies and Wuzzles had just one season and, you know, development was going on. So it was a very small group and a lot of energy. It was a lot of fun. And then when we got into the Disney afternoon, it was even better because we didn't have to have network approval for anything. It was basically if we could sell Michael and Jeffrey on an idea, we then did it. <laughs> Buena Vista uh, distribution had to take it. They didn't have any input. And we got a lot of close scrutiny for the first three scripts from our president, who was Gary Kreisel of TV Animation. And then he had stuff to do. So you were on your own. You'd come up with anything. And then when first footage came back, there was kind of like a little more scrutiny because is it going the way we expected? You know, how's it looking? What, how, what adjustments do we have to do? And you went back to doing whatever you wanted uh, and until it was about time to go on the air, at which time it'd either be good times or panic, depending on what they thought of your show. I mean, I couldn't have done Darkwing Duck and had the show we ended up with under any other situation because I was just trying all sorts of crazy, goofy things. I've just gone crazy! Come on, Dad. It's not that complicated. Cabbages from outer space are duplicating everybody in the world so they can take over the planet, and this cow, who's really an alien, has come here to recapture them. Just deal with it. It started as Jeffrey saying, hey, you did this episode of DuckTales called Double O Ducks. I want a show called Double O Duck. Again, I thought it's just a spy parody. There's no Disney heart to it. But, you know, boss said I got to do it. And that's all I presented to him. And he said the same thing. He says, there's no Disney heart to this. Do it over. Thank goodness. <laughs> you know, he should have said, get me somebody else. But instead, I went into, OK, what about the shadow? And Doc Savage had a team of guys who worked in secret. And ideas like that bubbled around Silver Age of Comics. And he really turned into more of a superhero, a non-super superhero than uh, a spy. But you could look at that pitch and really do a normal show, I guess. And then as we got into it, it was like, no, I'm pitching. What if you take, you know, Warner Brothers shorts and gave them heart? and 22 minutes instead of seven minutes and just gags. And that's what I was chasing, and some hit it better than others. When I was doing development, they wanted a new character, so I came up with Double O Duck, who at the time wasn't much more than visually was Donald Duck in a white tuxedo mask and a little hat. But anyway, when we were developing him, Launchpad was not in it. In my head, it was Doc Savage, who had a team of guys who worked with him and who were specialists, 
And then that shrunk because it was like too many people. And for a while, he had a sidekick who was a little guy who wore a derby. So it wasn't until Goslin entered the picture that we really had a show based on the idea that what if Batman had a little girl who refused to stay at home? Although I don't think we said it that concisely at the time. And we still felt like we needed a guy for Darkwing to talk to. And Launchpad, because he had been there in the beginning and we knew him, just seemed like that personality is great. So we brought him onto Darkwing, but really changed his design and subtracted many an IQ point from him. <laughs> so he's a lot dumber in our show. I got a whole scrapbook of your newspaper clippings. <laughs> Of course, it's not a very big scrapbook. Uh, well, wouldn't it be easier to fly if we were facing the other way? <laughs> oh, yes, <yeah>, sorry. <laughs> I sometimes have trouble with that. The real pilot for Darkwing Duck is an episode I wrote called That Sinking Feeling with Moliarty uh, as the villain, this guy who's based on the mole man, basically, except he really was a mole, stealing objects from the surface, bringing them down to the center of the Earth where he'd reconstruct them into this giant ray that was going to pull the moon out of orbit to block the sun so it would be darker on the surface and Moliarty and his minions could all live on the surface. That was the first one written and the first one boarded that we went into and act three of that for no reason at all they're in a baseball stadium and suddenly everybody's in except for the villain is in uh, baseball outfits it was that thing where bugs bunny would go off screen come back with a whole new costume we actually didn't get that level of breaking reality in the show a lot although we went crazy in different ways but that was the one that was testing out everything it really set up Goslin's relationship with Darkwing Duck and how close they were and her relationship to Honker so that was our pilot that's the first thing through then what everybody considers the pilot which is the four part darkly dawns the duck that story again became a little straighter but the main thing is everybody always asks about the origin of Darkwing Duck and I said you know, he's basically a Batman. What am I going to do? Have him sitting in his mansion and a duck breaks through a window and he goes, that's it, an omen. I shall become a duck. Wait, um, you know, there was nothing to tell there. I wasn't, certainly wasn't going to kill his parents and, you know, have him have this life of seeking revenge. So I said, no, let's address the heart. Let's bring Goslin. This is the story of how he adopted Goslin. And then that story got a little darker dealing with what happened to her parents. But that's what made you really care about her, so, and care about her predicament. Yeah, once again, saved by my buzzsaw cufflinks. Some of the things with Darkwing were very, not formulaic, but I had orders for my editors, and I said, every show he has to say, let's get dangerous. The secondary thing was suck gas evildoers when he used his gas gun. And too many people didn't hear the G, and it just didn't come up as much. So that one kind of fell away. Originally, he just had one thing that he said. He said, I'm the terror that flaps in the night. And I frankly forget the second line. It was like the third script in. It was an episode where Launchpad had to play the part of Darkwing. And he could never get the line right. He said, I am the uh, road salt that rusts the underside of your car. You know, he continually screwed up throughout the episode. And we all thought it was hilarious. And I said, you know what? Rewrite the scripts we've already got done. Let's give that to Darkwing. That's too good to just leave on this one episode. And that became his ongoing thing. I am the terror that flaps in the night. I am the jailer who throws away the key. I am... Feeling really stupid. Boy, I hate it when I'm early. <laughs> You'd think criminal masterminds would be more punctual. Dean Steffen, writer. So throughout the entire office, everyone from secretaries to producers and everything, they ran a contest. Name this character, name the star, name this guy. And out of all the names, out of all, you know, we each put in dozens. They picked Darkwing Duck, and of course it was Alan Burnett who came up with the name, and he got the 500 bucks. I would never conceive the name Darkwing Duck. It just doesn't make sense. But now, how could it be anything else? Actually, Reimers and Kuntz, who were my story editors, who by now had left Disney to seek their fortune in sitcoms, they sued Disney because they said they had written that Double O Duck episode of DuckTales and they thought they should be recompensed or whatever the word is. Of course, you know anything you do at Disney, they own anyway. But they did see some kind of settlement, I believe. I don't think it was huge. Then they later came back to Disney, so I guess there's no 
huge bad blood or maybe that was part of the, the, the deal. Tad really had the whole thing down. Our first, he was really into Twin Peaks at the time. I remember our first meeting where we all go into pitch stores and stuff. He had two bagels or donuts in front of everyone, which was like a thing from Twin Peaks. I wasn't a fan, so I didn't really know, but I knew it was sort of an iconic thing. And, you know, he was very um, into the whole Twin Peaks thing and very um, artsy stuff. And, and I would later make fun of him because he would, I guess it became such a big deal, this show, that he would start giving notes. You know, everybody would write out notes and give it to the story editors and stuff like He would start cassette taping his notes, like from some undisclosed location, like Howard Hughes or something. And then the cassette would arrive at the story editors, and then they would play the cassette for you. And I would say, what, what is going on here? A lot of that may have been because of his hours. He liked to get there at like five in the morning and leave at two or three in the afternoon because he had kids and he just, he was an early guy. Most people like me, I mean, I'm probably the worst case, but you know, before 10 a.m., forget it. You know, so I never worked directly under him where I had to report to him directly as a story editor, but um, you know, he liked, he liked to run a tight ship, I think. But the, the, the cassette notes were a bit much. I am the thing that goes thump in the night. I'm the neuroses that requires a $500 an hour shrink. I know when we started Darkwing, they wanted to do a Darkwing Duck movie and the studio in Paris that later went on to work on features, they did a bunch of development that was totally ignoring what the show was. I took one stab at it. Again, this is the opposite of being left to do whatever you want. I had to pitch this and it didn't go. And I just said, you know, I can't do both. I can't do a movie and get the show up and running. So I'm just gonna do the show. I only found this out recently. They thought that maybe that should be a musical. Jim Megan was actually gonna have meetings with Barry Manilow, ended up having a meeting with another big music guy, not a, not a name you would know as a star, but that was just crazy. And that really showed that, man, they don't understand what Darkwing Duck is. So thank goodness that didn't happen. I am the terror that flaps in the night. I am the weirdo who sits next to you on the bus. I am the Swan Prince. With the Disney afternoon well on its way, it was time for the first of the Fab Five to get his own vehicle. I think they were going to originally do it as a uh, as a scout troop to the show, and that's why it's called Goof Troop. I was not there for that development, but when it finally came along to, if he's going to live in Spanerville and you know, I have an extra neighbor, Pete. That's when we developed the show in earnest. We looked at those old cartoons of Mr. Geef or Goof or whatever that his last name was supposed to be. And he was always, a, you know, lived in the suburbs and would wave bye-bye to his wife as she would, you know, get in the car and drive off. And he was in charge of the kid for the day. Goofy would make mistakes and the son would just go along with it. And, and I remember thinking, well, we've got to kind of make it more interesting than that. And I, you look for the key to the series, and the key to Goof Troop for me was I don't want to grow up to be my dad. And I think we felt like, yeah, that's that's what we want. We want this guy who's a single dad trying to raise his kid right and lives next door to this bad influence, you know, Pete and his family. You know, that to us was where all the um, comedy cold was to mine. You know, it was, you know, skateboards and school and working in town and commuting and stuff like that. My forte was always in the comedy adventure, you know, dummies and rescue rangers and tailspin and that kind of thing. Goof Troop was more of a sitcom, you know, <laughs> more over and surely that kind of thing. It feels like adventure to me because Goofy found a way to mess everything up. Michael Spooner, artist. I was the principal layout designer uh, on a project we decided to go with the style of 101 Dalmatians, where it was line art. The painter would actually do a watercolor under a cell line. So my line art would be transferred to Xerox to cell, like traditional animation was, and then they would do a watercolor. I had done so much design on the town in which he lived, the studio decided to uh, uh, name it Spoonerville. Jim Magon, original pitch for syndicators to buy Goof Troop. So I want to introduce you to Goof Troop. And in it, Goofy is now a man of the 90s. He's a single cat living in suburbia with his three phones, two TVs, one cat, and a very contrary 11-year-old son. Let me take you through a day in the life. An alarm clock goes off. It belongs to good old Goofy, that good-natured klutz whose motto is, a day without sunshine is like night. Oh, yeah. Goofy embraces the dawn like every other obstacle in his life. 
with boundless and bumbling enthusiasm. Now I want to show you the difference. Here's his son, Goofy Jr., or Max as he likes to be called, because he hates being saddled with an adjective like his father. Anyway, as you can tell from Max's enthusiasm, this is a school day. Now, Max loves Bo Jackson. Uh, Goofy thinks he's one of the Jackson Five. <laughs> Max loves Mario Brothers. Goofy's pretty sure they beat him up in the third grade. Max loves his VCR. Goofy can't spell VCR. <laughs> anyway, Goofy gets downstairs to make a nutritious breakfast. Or more to the point, a nutritious mess. Junior, our food's on! Well, Max heads downstairs, shaking his head, wondering how did such a radical kid like me end up with such a goof for a father? What? seldom falls far from the tree. However, this is a curse that Max is determined to break. He desperately wants to swim out of the deep end of his father's gene pool. But you know, through all these crazy escapades, the one thing that Max learns is, just when you're convinced your folks are totally useless, they're there for you when you're totally useless. So relax, Max. Your father ain't so bad. He's just goofy. Now let's face it, kid. You're a little goofy. Welcome to the Goof Troop, kid. I had done an episode called Have Yourself a Goofy Little Christmas, which the, the idea of the, the father-son going off and father wants to do one thing that's traditional and the son wants to do something different, that to me felt the most like the movie uh, and kind of set the tone. And at one point we were going to do, I think, a two-parter that was Goofy and the son on vacation. And somehow that two-parter turned into the idea to do another, uh, well, it was called Movie Tunes at the time, the, when we did the DuckTales movie. And that was driven pretty much by uh, Mr. Katzenberg, who told us a really interesting story about how he was losing touch with his daughter. And he decided, we're just going to take time off, and she and I are going to get the car and just go somewhere. And uh, he says, I don't know where it happened or how it happened, but we connected on that trip being you know, trapped in a car together. That became the gist of the Goofy movie, which was the father wants to go one way, the son wants to go another way, and then they finally find each other along the way. That was very rewarding for me to be able to move from the TV show into the feature film. Oh, well, you know, I sat by myself for a long time, and then they finally brought in um, Kevin Lima. Kevin just had a whole plethora of people he uh, trusted, you know, and they were great. The film took off from there. And I think of all my experiences in animation, that was the most, I want to make sure I say this right, kind of the most disconcerting because it was so different from writing for episodic television. Because in episodic television, the writer becomes king. You know, it is. I'm not sure that that's the correct position for the writer, but just because of the time limitations, you had to have something written and basically directed on paper and then everybody followed it that's the way you could get it done in time but when it came to a movie it was a very flexible thing and lots of people are involved and they're changing their sequence and that sequence is so powerful that it changes that sequence and and suddenly the writers huh i think i recognize one of my lines in here you know <laughs> i think moss hart said that i would come into work and i had written a sequence and then it would be storyboarded and i look at this and say this is genius. I wish I'd written this, you know. <laughs> it was terrific. And it was such a new way of working for me, you know. So it was disconcerting from the standpoint that, gee, I don't have the kind of control over the project that I used to have on TV. But that's not to say that they weren't doing spectacular work and that I was such a lucky guy to be a part of it. While I feel like I brought the essence of I don't want to grow up to be my dad, I really feel like so much of all the, the clever little things and the sort of telling moments, that was Kevin and his team, you know, coming in there with their stuff. And it was just such a delight to work with them. And that's why I think I was upset because I didn't get to follow through on the movie. I was pulled and, you know, go over here and work on Duck Days. We went to lunch as I was leaving the series. We went to Sizzler of all places. And I just said, God, I, I feel so bad, Kevin, because I, I, I wanted to be so helpful and, and such an important part of this. And, and I feel like so much of what I did, you know, didn't end up on the screen. And he said, but Jim, you know, we wouldn't be doing what we're doing if we weren't standing on your shoulders. And it was like, oh, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> Made me feel better. <laughs> so, you know, it, that's just it. Part of the creative process is, you know, the first link in the chain sometimes doesn't look like the last link in the chain. <laughs> you know, it gets, 
it's painted a different color along the way. After the company had dabbled in its most famous IPs, the next show would be a wholly original character. Well, sort of. Bonkers was loosely based on the idea of Roger Rabbit. He was a former cartoon star who had fallen on tough times after his show had been canceled and became a cop teamed with a human partner. But its production was mired in reboots and dissatisfaction. Greg Weissman, creator, Gargoyles. Well, I mean, Bonkers is complicated. Bonkers was a show that I developed and uh, got Dwayne Capizzi, the, the producer, story editor. Bob Hathcock was chosen to be the director producer on it. We had real high hopes for it. But unlike Gargoyles, that was a show where I got it up and running and then I walked away from it and other people were supposed to be paying attention to it. And the very first two or three episodes that came back didn't look very good from an animation standpoint. I'm not sure that initially the show was art directed very well. You know, we had humans and quote unquote tunes, even though the whole thing was animated. And I think there should have been a distinct, more kind of realistic art style, not gargoyles necessarily, but something even from a color palette standpoint that felt a little less cartoony so that the quote-unquote tunes on the show like Roger Rabbit and Jitter's Dog really popped because they were tunes in a human world. Um, and I don't think that art direction ever quite came off. But I think we had a really smart show which featured Bonkers partnered with Miranda Wright as a cop. Bonkers drove her crazy, but he was her partner, so she'd back him no matter what, and ultimately they were friends. And we did a lot of smart, sort of clever things about what it would be like in a Roger Rabbit vein to live in a world with tunes and humans. And then I think, honestly, that some of the executives, when the first stuff came back and didn't look very good, overreacted. There were certainly problems, maybe even some problems with the writing, but I don't think the problems were quite as problematic as some people thought. And I think, frankly, most of it could have been fixed by fine-tuning the art direction. But, you know, I wasn't in charge, and I was also in the process of trying to move over to Gargoyles, and all this stuff was sort of happening simultaneously. I did get dragged back into it, and at some point it became clear that to Gary that he wanted some real wholesale changes here, and neither Dwayne nor Bob were giving him that. So both of them wound up getting booted off the show. And uh, a guy named Bob Taylor, who had done Goof Troop, was brought in. And Bob made some very drastic and I think unnecessary changes to the show. He did get the art direction better, but Bob didn't think girls were funny. So he ditched Miranda and put in a character who, in essence, was Pete from Goof Troop and was voiced with Pete's voice by Jim Cummings. And Jim was great. Jim voiced Bonkers. I love Jim. But, you know, it was just a dynamic that we had seen before. The storylines were, I thought, way less interesting, and I was really not happy with the change in direction on the show. And then, of course, you know, they wanted this stuff first. So it, it all got very rushed. And they didn't, they couldn't throw away the dozen or so episodes that featured Miranda so even though that stuff was made first, it aired last, and they actually created an episode where Piquel joins the FBI and moves away, and Bonkers is partnered with Miranda for the last dozen episodes, which, again, were the dozen or so that were made first. But they created a new pilot and basically played it as if the Piquel stuff was first and the Miranda stuff was second when it was really the other way around. And so, you know, it became a show of... It makes me sad, <laughs> but because uh, um, I think a lot of potential was squandered there, um, and I think a lot of the changes was uh, were unnecessary. And uh, to be fair, Taylor and I didn't really see eye to eye on anything, and I finally just begged off and asked Gary to take me off the project because I didn't think I was helping Bob because we agreed on almost nothing, and and. Uh, so I was just, a, you know, in his way, and and Gary had gone with uh, Taylor, and it was his show now, so, you know, I had to let it go. And so Gary said, okay, and I sort of stepped away from the project and had very little involvement with all but the first um, couple Cal episodes, which I didn't care for, um, which doesn't mean they're bad. It just, you know, wasn't the show I had developed and wasn't the show that I wanted to make. 
bonkers hit the air in 1993. It had almost been a decade since the brunch that started it all. In that time, Disney television had gone from non-existent to the standard that everyone else had to chase. The problem was, by the time Bonkers hit the air, other networks had already caught up and would even take the lead. And now Disney television animation would have to decide if they were going to chase by rebranding or stick with the girl who brought them to the dance. There were all these people from different studios. There were people like me that had never worked for any studio in animation. Uh, you know, I was a record producer. So I think it was Art Patel and I were talking and, and we said, are we doing this right? Are we doing a Disney TV show correctly? And then we realized, well, there's never been a Disney TV show, at least a Saturday morning style TV show. And therefore, <laughs> because we work for Disney and we're making these shows, uh, we are Disney. <laughs> what we're doing is Disney, you know. And uh, and that whatever we were doing, whether it was right or wrong, would be a Disney show. 